Hello everyone, you are about to listen to the teaching of Pastor Raymond Burnett, pastor of Mana Worship Center. We hope that you will learn from the message you are about to hear and to realize that books will inform, but the Bible has the power to transform you. Now sit back and open your mind and heart for God to speak to you. Hebrews tells you that Christ is better than everything that you and I were exposed to in the Old Covenant. So he's better than the prophets with his message. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Abraham. He's better than the covenant then. That's the whole concept. He's making this comparison and contrasting it to say that Christ is better. All the things they had was good, but that which Christ has provided is my mind is better. Everything that the old covenant had was good, and that which is in the new covenant is better. That's the whole lie there. Is better. Today I want us to focus a little bit on, on, on angels. But it's a part of angels that I want us to think about as heirs of God. So I want you to keep that in your mind. Hebrews chapter 1. And let's read a little part of it. From verse 1 to verse 4, Christ is better or superior to prophets. And that's not where I want to go with it today, but I want to highlight something. God, who at sundry times or different times and in diverse manners, speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So the subject matter is prophets. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. What is he doing? He's comparing the prophets that spoke then and the final person who is better is whom? Very good. Fantastic class. Whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. And he goes into a whole pile of discussions. Now, all I want to highlight to you is there. Whom he hath appointed heirs of what? All things. Now, that word appointed all things is similar when God said in Genesis chapter 17 that Abraham was appointed as the father of the whole nation of Israel. Abraham only had one child. But yet, he's called the father of the nation. Can I say that again? A man showing up with one child, well, the child of promise, but he had another son, we all know that. He's called, the, he's better than, I mean, great, great fellow, but he's the father of many nations. Is that good? Father of what? Many nations. Many nations. He now has, is the heir of all that's going on there among those people. Father Abraham. You know that one, Father Abraham. Christ now is appointed as the heir of all things. Everything this world can ever think, dream, imagine, see, or what, Christ is the heir of that. Means it belongs to him. He's in charge of this. He, he, God is saying, everything that I have was created, even though he helped me doing it, it's all his. Now think this one thought before I go back to that text. If Christ owns it all, is appointed to be the owner of it all because he's the heir of the Father. When the Bible said we are joint heir, what does that say to you? Oh, yes. We own it too. 
So all the things that Christ has made available, not Abraham here now. That's why I want you to keep your mind. Abraham was promised the land. No, I am not going to show up in Israel sometimes and say, where's my peace? You get it? They were promised an earthly heritage, a piece of land, promised land. Joshua brought them into it. Moses led them towards it. David ruled it. Solomon ruled it. All these people did that. They got the land, never owned all of it, but one day all of it will come back to them during the time of the millennium. I said that to you before. So, but Christ has prepared a better place with better promises, all spiritual blessings, all of that is also ours. So therefore, when I think about that, a child of God, any child of God, anybody who's been born of the Spirit, who's become a born-again child of God, is quite a privileged person. We behave like we don't have anything, no sense, according to you. We behave like we are not valuable. We are quite valuable. We are supposed to be the most outstanding set of people on planet Earth, behaving like we know who we are, acting like we know the God we talk about, and not just talk about him, but we know him. And this week, I keep saying to myself, the God you preach and teach about, do you really know him? The God we talk about, do we really know him? Because God is really not very well known by those who talk about him. We talk about him, but we may not know him. Are you hearing this now? Now that happens in your everyday life. People talk about you, but they don't know you. You get the point I'm making now? People, people talk about you, but they don't, they, don't, they don't know you. So if somebody doesn't really know you, they don't have the right to really talk like they know you. How about the child of God? We talk about God as if we really know him, but are we convincing them that we know the God? And if we know the God, listen to the next part he keeps saying to me, and if you know me as you talk about how you know me about me, then there ought to be a difference always in your life consistently, not on a Monday, on a Tuesday, or on a Sunday when you go to church. You should not be friendly only on a Sunday. And not sure what you're like on a Monday. You should be confident on a Sunday. And on Wednesday you don't have any confidence. Are you getting this now? The knowing of the God is to have a personal relationship with God. And as we get closer to him and becoming like him. Here's the best part I like. Then the evidence of God being known by us. Being present in us. Should always be demonstrated outside of us. So people should be able to say. You must have a connection with something that we don't know about. I would, I would like when people tell me things about me that reflects God in me. One lady said to me, you're very kind. I said, thank you. Do you know that God is always kind? So the character of God is his kind. The character of a child of God should be what? Kind. Are you kidding this? If, if you have a son or you raise a son, there are going to be some similarities of you and the child. So if the child takes on those kind of character that you've demonstrated, you say, boy, you're just like your father or you're just like your mother. What are the point I'm making is when you know the person, the demonstration of those things will come out in your life. God said Christ has appointed all of it. We are joined here with him. We too. That should make me feel good about me. That should make you tap your back. Tap your back. I'm feeling good about me today. So let's begin to behave and talk like that. Now, so in the first part of Hebrews, Christ is compared to the prophets. But the part I want to go to is verse 5. Now from verse 5 to chapter 18, verse chapter 2, verse 18, Christ is superior to angels. We're only going to cover maybe the first few verses, maybe from verse 1, Maybe down to verse, I'm going to read to verse 14. Let me just read that because I want you to get it. For unto which of the angels saith he at any time? Now, thou art my son. Let me pause again. I'm going to give you a little bit of a Bible study program here now. Seven different times, the writer of the book of Hebrews 
quoted from the Old Testament to the people who were reading it in the New Testament times. One of the statements is the one I just read. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Do you know, the only person in the Bible that God the Father has ever called my begotten son is Jesus. He's saying, I never said this about the angels. None of them, Michael, Gabriel, I don't know what other name they may have there. He said, I've never called an angel my begotten son. You know God has never said, call us the begotten son either. We are the beloved. Did you hear that? We are in the beloved. But Christ is the only one who is called the begotten. This is my begotten son in whom I'm well pleased. Remember that? The day when he was baptized. He called him his begotten son. Not a son that has a beginning in existence when he came on the earth. But the son who was begotten means to beget means to pro propagate, to move from you to somebody else. What it is, is like he's saying, out of, out of me, God is saying, out of me has come forth a son. A father can say, out of me has come forth my son. A mother can say, out of me has come forth a son. That's what the father is saying here. Out of me, my begotten son has come forth. Praise God. Now, so he quoted a number of scriptures there, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pause much more until I get down to verse 14. He said, Out of the begotten son, and again, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth into the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Well, that's what happened on the day when Christ was what? Born. The angels were singing praises for him. He's quoting about Christ. And of the angels, going back to the angels now, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits or wind, and his ministers a flame of fire? Well, oh, wow. There's an insertion. He's inserting something here. The angels are described as those spirits that operate like wind. They're here now, they're gone. They operate in fire. They burn here and they stop the burning. Angels are powerful spirits then. They can create and they can walk and move wherever, however fast. Here now, disappear. Do you know that Christ is more powerful than what the angels are able to do there? Let's keep on reading. Better be careful. I don't want to keep on going through all that because there's so much stuff to tell you. Verse 8. But unto the Son saith he, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and had hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, had anointed thee. Talk about Christ. With the oil of gladness above all our life fellows. So Christ has anointed the oil of gladness. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of thine hand. He's talking about Christ still. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as a garment. He's talking about the earth and the heaven that Christ has created. It's going to be one day destroyed, but he's going to keep on getting better. As a vesture thou shalt fold them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Then he said, but to which of the angels saith he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He said that never to an angel. But, verse 14, key word. Are they angels? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are, who shall be heirs of salvation. Now, I want you to follow me closely with what I'm going to tell you about right now. Two times in that verse, 14, the word minister or ministering is mentioned. 
See it there? Are thou not ministering spirit? Sent forth. To what? Minister for whom? For those who are heirs of salvation. Everyone who's born of the Spirit of God is now an heir of the salvation of God. That means your ownership is included in that. But here's a very important Bible study information to remember. The word minister and the word ministering has the same Greek word. Diakonos. D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S. That's what that is. That word is mentioned approximately 30 times in the New Testament. 30 times. When you read in Acts chapter 6 about the people in the church asked to choose deacons. Remember that? Choose you out seven men from among you to serve tables. That's what the word is. A deacon, a diaconos man or woman is someone, this is the description, who is a service motivated individual. One who is like a slave called to serve for the benefit of other people. Did you get that? Always waiting on tables. Running errands all over the place. That's what a servant did and still does. God is saying, one second now. So then the angels are servants of God for the benefit of those of us who are Heirs of salvation. That's a good place to clap. You don't have to do it right now because you didn't plan to do it then. What's the point I'm making? The writer of Hebrews is saying, I've just told you about Jesus, the Son of God, the one who's been appointed to be heir of everything, the one who said, Thou art made by beloved. He's saying to us that there's a batch of of created beings called angels, now given the responsibility as servants to those who are seeking God as of salvation. I said to myself, you mean to tell me that I've got a group of people working on my behalf, not because I asked them to, because that's their responsibility? It's part of their responsibility. No, they did all kinds of things in the Old Testament. They also did in the New Testament. I'm going to give you four examples and run them through shortly. But angels, God has put them in place for the benefit of mankind. Yes. You mean for Raymond Burnett's benefit? Yeah. You mean Aileen Patterson benefit? How about Debbie Patterson? You think just half of her? All of them. The angels ministering spirits, servants, errand runners, working on the behalf, working for, working with those of us who are born of the Spirit of God. What a feeling that should give us today. So, Nadi, when your mother was protected and the angel got involved in making sure your dad didn't do anything foolish prematurely. Are you hearing me now? When you were driving and that car came and hit you by the side, the angel said, you're not going to take your life today. Ah, you like that? Not going to take your life today. You may beat up the car, mess up the, the body of the car. But that's it. But God said, one day I'm going to mess you guys up too. Satan is going to be, I show you something today, and one angel is going to do wonder with Satan. One angel. I showed it to you in the Bible shortly. One angel is going to do this. Not all of them. You don't need all of them to, to fix him. One. <laughs> I got thinking, wow, we are in the greatest, we got the greatest deal. We are in the greatest place on this earth to be children of the most high God. If the church understands what we have and our place in God, it would be a very different kind of interpersonal relationship with one another, but also inter-church fellowship with one another. Because we're not at war with each other. We are not competing with one another. 
we are working together to bring other people into the airship that they are entitled to because of Christ. That's where we are. Praise God for that. So, let me give you four examples, four categories of how the angels work. Because I'm going to be running through this one. First, first of all, in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew, go backwards to Matthew chapter 4. And the context to this, that Jesus was being led by the Spirit of God to be tested by the enemy. Remember he was tried, tested by the enemy? Okay. Matthew chapter 4. If you were to read Mark chapter one, Mark over co only covers the temptation in two verses. That's it. Mark only said, Matthew took care of that. I only need to give them a summary. That's how many of us do. We give summarizing what somebody else has made a long story of. So Matthew told us about the three temptations. There may have been a whole pile more, but he lists three of them. Matthew chapter 4, I want to read verse 11. In fact, let me read from verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, to Satan, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Whoa. Now many of us have read that statement many times before. Amen. But maybe we hadn't paid attention to what the angel was up to and why he, ha why he had to do that. Now think about this one. We had three recorded temptations that Jesus went through. And we think it may be categorized to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, turn stone to bread. Lust of the eyes, look at all of these things that I'm showing you, like the enemy will do, to show us all we can get in the world if you will only bow down. Pride of life. Throw yourself down and God will hold you up. Proof to the world that you are the son of God because he will elevate you. Pride of life. Mankind, every human being is exposed to the same three categories of temptation. Christ went through it for 40 days and 40 nights. Somebody once said, it took the enemy, Satan, 40 days and 40 nights to just test him three times. That's why sometimes I think it's not just three times. I think it may be a lot of things, but they categorize it. I believe any and every area that any human being can ever be tested or tried, I believe Christ went through every single one of them. We got three examples. That's my understanding of that text. Amen. Now you may say, Pastor, I, he won't tempt me to go. I don't like bread, so why are you going to tempt me to eat bread? Uh, some people don't eat bread. They think the, the flour is bad for them. So, uh, praise God, I won't be tempted to turn stone into bread. I'm good to know this. Well, he was hungry. Well, how about if he tempted you, the enemy tempted you to overeat one day, and you can't move out of the chair? <laughs> All you can eat is buffet. $25 eat it, but you can't take anything home. Do you know there are some people in certain parts of the world where when there's a buffet dinner, some people have asked to leave. It is a fact. It is a fact. They ask them, it's time to go. You have gone up enough time. No, in my mind, you cannot eat the whole house out. You can only eat so much. But to them, you've had your fair share. I smile when I read that article. I'm thinking, wow. They actually told him to stop. Or they can eat, advertise, but you need to stop. Well, let's go on here. And the Bible said, And when Jesus was finished being tempted by the enemy, the angels came to him and strengthened him. To strengthen means some wonderful things. It means to impart strength, to empower, to fill with vigor, and to recharge him. Wow. You mean to tell me he was drained so much by being tested and withstanding and fighting against it that he was drained physically? Yes. He needed to be recharged. 
Have you ever found yourself in a situation where after you've gone through it or coming close to getting through it, you feel tired or drained? Have you ever wondered, and as of today, maybe you start thinking this, when you are drained, you know what is available to us? The angels are there, but if you and I are not conscious to acknowledge his presence, he may very well be doing it. Or we may be the one hindering him from working, taking care of business for us. Because maybe we don't know that that is available. We did not know it's available for him to invigorate us. So what should I do the next time I feel like this? Father God, you know, I feel drained today. Can you kind of infuse some stuff in me today? He said, go fix him up. Give him a shot of adrenaline. Cause him to feel alive again. I believe all that is included in this experience. Did you get that? Should I say it again or are we good? We good? You got it? First boss? The angel, Christ didn't pray for an angel to come. They are servants. When a servant sees a master in need, you don't have to ask him, are you coming to help me out? No, 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 no. The, 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 the servants are always keeping an eye on the master. That's he's paid for that job. When the master looks like he needs a towel, he said, here you go. Pass him a towel, mop his face up. You good now? Yes, I'm good now. He gets them good. You want a glass of water? Have you ever noticed that people who knows how, the, people, the people who know how to serve, it's easy for them to offer you something? Let me explain that. People who understand what serving is like, you don't have to ask them, do you have a bottle of water? They will say, we have a bottle of water. Would you like one? I've had this experience so many times. I go up and say, you look a little bit exhausted. You look like you could use a bottle of water. Thank you. I didn't ask. The Spirit of God said, put in somebody's heart, he needs some water, offer him some water, allow me to say thank you. Man, have you ever had that water when it's cold on the inside of your body? You feel this cool thing happening to you? That's what a servant does. He looks for the area of need and meet the need. Angels do that. Hmm. Give you another one under the same category where the angels, in this case, minister to Christ. Luke chapter 22. Give you that quickly. Luke chapter 22. Jesus was in Gethsemane at this time. And um, his disciples were with him. Verse 20, 39 said, and he came out and went, and as he, as he went, or went known, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, the disciples, Pray ye that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about the stones cast, and he kneeled down and prayed. By the way, this is where most of us, um, when we were growing up, we're told, whenever you're going to have your prayer time, go and kneel down. It is not the only position to pray. I thought I should tell you that. Um, it's okay to pray. There are people who have prayed. There's one guy who prayed so much that the spot where he prayed for all year round, there were holes bored in it. It sunk in the wood. His knees wore it out. In fact, his callus on his knee was so serious that nobody ever paid attention. His, his looked really bad. You wore the place out, it will take a toll on your knee. Jesus kneeled down to pray. Look what happened here. He knew he has his disciples with him. He's been going through a rest of verse 16. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Next verse is the key verse. 
Then appear, there appeared an angel unto him from where? Heaven. And what the angel do? Strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise up and pray, lest you be entered into temptation. So hold a second now. Jesus had been praying through, walking through the pressure of the sin of every single human person that ever lived on planet Earth, that will continue to live on planet Earth. Paying the price for mankind was heavy on him. I am absolutely convinced about this. If all the sins I have ever committed in my life, I'm not talking about you now, because you probably didn't do many. If all the sins that I have ever committed in my life, the wages of sin is death. If I were to personally experience all of the consequences of every single one of them, I would have been dead a long time ago. But maybe you would have been alive because you probably had a better chance. What is my point? My point is sin is heavy. Sin is weighty. weighty. Sin puts a weight on you. It makes a demand on you in every area of your life. Multiply that one sin that you were struggling with that put that weight on you with all the other sins and put all the weight together in the same hole. Multiply every single billion of person, every single person on the billions of people that lived on planet Earth and put that on something and rest it on Christ. He needs strengthening. The father said, oh my God. I know you say we go, you're going to go, but, boy, but that's hard on you, man. That's real hard. Sin is heavy. The weight of sin is heavy. So he needed to be strengthened. Same eye there. He needed to be infused with. He needed a little injection of adrenaline again. Why? Because he's not finished praying yet. You get the point I'm making? He's not finished yet. As he continued, he needed a little bit of a boost so that the next round would become a little bit bearable. At that point, when he got to the next stage, what happened? He began to sweat. The pressure was heavy. And the blood capillaries of his head got broken so much so that it came down as sweats of blood. He needed the help. It didn't say the father came and did it. It was an angel that ministered. So there is an angel, and there are guardian angels, we call them. They are ministering spirits sent by God for our benefit. That's the first question. Let me give you a couple more. Two more, three more. Let's run through the other two, three more. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. It has to do with the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. First one, he is strengthening people. And now the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. You're going to like this one. Chapter 2. What did I say to you? Amen. Chapter 2. Slip of the mouth. I saw two in front of me and I gave you six. All right. You got it? Look at verse 13. Matthew chapter 6, sorry, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. That sick is stuck in my head. It's just unstuck it. 13 said, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child. To destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Two things I'm going to say to you. Context first and then this. Context was, Jesus was born. It wasn't at the night when he was born. It wasn't the night. He was approximately two years old. 
the way in which you read the Bible too. It's probably two years old. The, the, the wise men had come from the east. They had seen the star. They came to Herod's place because they assumed that any king going to be born got to be born here. Herod said, no, not here. And they kept on walking, and they followed the star, and then they found where Mary and Joseph had the baby. They went and worshipped him. They were warned in a dream not to go back and tell Herod. Praise God for that, eh? But here's the point. After that was done, Herod decided that these guys did not come back. They didn't come and tell me whether they found them or not. I want to go worship the king. Herod lied. He wanted to really kill the king to, that would threaten him. So he put out a law that all the baby boys, two years and under, will be killed. Something like in some places I know in Egypt. Joseph being a just man, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, Old Testament concept of the angel of the Lord is called a Christophany, an meaning an appearance of Christ before he came in the flesh. Christophany. Christ, Christ Theo means an appearance. Christophany, an appearance of Christ. If somebody say, Theophany means God appearance. Theo means God, and the other one is the parents. So it is believed, Old Testament, that Christ appeared in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. Remember when Abraham was there and they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? And these angels came down and one stayed outside and believed that there's an appearance of Christ before he became flesh. That's a whole part of another story to tell you about. But in this case, New Testament concept is Christ is there, the baby. So it's the angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord came down in a dream. Joseph, I want you to pay attention to what I'm going to say. When you get up, take Mary, take the baby, run, go to Egypt. Now here's a little bit of discussion that is more racially motivated here. Now, there are a lot of discussions about Christ being whatever shade, color he was. If Jesus was whatever color people advertise him to be, if you want to hide a baby, you're going to send him to Egypt? And you get the point I'm making? Herod, Herod will get the news. Hey, there's a little child down in Egypt, the kingdom for Jerusalem. He kind of stands out with the rest. No, 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 no. no. He just blended in. He's part of that. You get the point I'm making there now? I'm just giving you a little bit of a, a background of some things that people argue about that make big about it, but it's really not that big after all. It's simple. So they took off and went to Egypt. He stayed there, played and carried on with everybody else because he looked like them. Jesus in Egypt? Well, there's some Old Testament prophecies that are prophesied, out of Egypt, my son will come. Well, God fulfilled that peace too because God knew he would go there. He's going to have to leave there. Are you getting me now? In the same chapter, when Herod was dead, Herod died, you know. Mm -hmm. He died. Pointed unto man wants to. It was Herod's turn. After Herod was dead now. The Bible didn't tell us how old he was when he came back. It didn't tell us how long. And I guarantee you that Herod didn't just die a week after. Jesus had to have been in Egypt for quite some time. He could have very well been 8 or 9 or 10 years old by then. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. I'm just guessing aged with that one. Let me show what happened. Same book, chapter Matthew, book of Matthew, chapter 2. Look at verse 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Where was he now? Oh, wonderful. And when Her and uh, saying, arise and take the young child. That means he had not come to the age of being a teenager yet. Because when he was 12 years old, remember later on, he went to the temple. So he was before 12. Take the young child, he said, and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which saw the young child's life. And he rose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Egypt. Israel. Now, the 
angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. I'm going to ask you to start thinking seriously about dreams. Many of us don't pay attention to dreams. Some of the dreams we can do without. Last week I had two kind of dreams, all kind of dreams. I was dreaming all over the place. But one of them made a lot of sense. In my dream, I was saying a couple of things to this one person. I only said one so far because I don't think the person was ready for the second one. It wasn't for me to do that, but I did it. I'm so sorry, Lord, you know. But I've had dreams. When God wanted me to go to Bible college, God knew the only way he can talk to me to get it. No preacher can ever come to me and tell me this is what God wants you to do. Nobody. He knew I would not listen. He knew I looked at him and said, you must be crazy. Me? Absolutely not. He talked to me in a dream. I thought, got up in the morning and wrote my dream out. I remember that clearly as it was yesterday, December 12th, 1974. I remember that. 12th of December. I wrote it there. Some of you weren't even born, right? 1974. I may have only been two years old, right? 1974. And listen to this now. And my dream, I didn't have it back in St. Vincent. I had it in Toronto. God, he, he, if he had talked to me back then, I thought I must have eaten something bad last night. That caused me to do it. And in my dream, I dreamt that I went back to St. Vincent. I, I dreamt that clearly as it was yesterday. I don't have to read it all over again. I know what it says. I walked into a church. I sat in the back of the church. I'm visiting, remember? The fellow in the front noticed. He said, ah, oh, I see Raymond back there. Would you come and sing for us? Shucks. I mean, in my, in my dream, I'm thinking, come and sing again. I just came. And I got, slowly got up, began to walk to the front of the church. I took a few steps, and I began to cry. I broke down and cried like a baby in the church in my dream. My pillow was actually wet when I got up in the morning. I cried. And all the voice said to me in my dream was, gather my sins together unto me. That's all he said, gather my sins. I got up and wrote the dream out. It didn't make any sense. Didn't think of Bible college. Didn't think about anything. It had nothing to do with Bible college to me. A few months after, I'm reading through, reading through the book of Psalms for my devotional now. I came to Psalm 50. Psalm 50 verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me. And he gave me the rest. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So I paused and I said, wow, that statement is in the Bible. I was amazed. See, and before I just thought God was just talking, telling me something, gather my saints together to me. Because I was involved in a youth activity at that time. So that's great. Praise God. So I said, I asked the wrong question. God, what does this mean? should never have asked that, eh? I asked it anyway. He was silent for a few weeks. And then later on he talked. And I fought and fought and fought. I said, no, no, not me at all. I put my heels down. Not forgetting that my heels is on the ground that he owns. What's my point? God talks to people in dreams. If you don't have a book yet, remember the book I gave some of you? Try writing down your dreams in a book. Keep a record of them, and you'll see patterns of things that happen in your dreams. There'll be similar comments that God will make to you, and he will help you to string them along. Not every dream is from God, though. Be very careful which one you really believe. Check the scriptures and see if there's anything connected to what you've just dreamt. That was important. So God talked to me in a dream. God will also talk to you in dreams. So be open to them. Say, God, I'm ready now. You can talk to me in a dream, but don't do this. Don't ask God, not, don't tell God what not to do. Don't be like me. Learn from my example, okay? So that was the second one that happened then. And the other one, you can read this at your own convenience. Acts chapter 10, uh, from verse 1 to 3. The man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. And the angel came to him in a dream one night and gave him a tell him things. And in the dream, he said to me, him, I want you to go and call a man named Peter. Tell Peter to come over, because this man had been praying. 
A Gentile praying? Yes. God said, I have heard your prayer, and I want to bring you into the family. So send for Peter, and Peter will come and tell you what you need to do. Well, Peter went over. I mean, he sent messengers to get Peter to come, all that kind of stuff. But when that was all done, in a dream, in a dream, he had it. But in the dream, the angel spoke to him. In the dream, the angel talked. When Peter came, he explained to him about being saved, born again. The whole household got saved. First Gentiles got a message from an angel in a dream. Amazing, eh? So you know people can be, can be led to come to God in dreams too? Lord, talk to them in a dream. If they're really stubborn, talk to them in a dream. Just like Raymond, talk to them in a dream. Because he had to talk to me in a dream. Some of you sitting here thinking, God has already talked to me in a dream. <laughs> well, here's good news for you. He's going to talk again if you're stubborn. But he expects you to respond to what he's spoken to you about. Would you remember that? He wants you to be obedient to what he said to you in a dream. That sounds just like you. I'm looking you straight in your eye down there. You need to do it. We have this way, way. Third point, and then we wrap up. Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 5. This is protection and deliverance. This is the part I want you to keep in your mind because it has to do with all of us. In about five, seven minutes, we'll finish by this, I, I believe. Acts chapter 5. Reading from verse 17 to 20. And here's what it says. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Hmm. And laid hands, their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Wow. Well, what happened then? Well, the Lord was adding to the church. In Acts chapter 5, we had Ananias and Sapphira, and God was purging out his church, and a great multitude of people got healed, and people with demon-possessed were healed, and the high priest, and the, 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 what they decided to do, they decided they're going to look for the man who's the leader of the group, and all the apostles were guilty of this. So these, this high priest had a group of people called the Sadducees. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. And they were teaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not believe in it. So the high priest decided, I am not going to align myself together with the Pharisees today. Because they believe in the message, the resurrection. I'm going to find me another group of religious people called the Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection. So when they brought them together to have a discussion in the little gathering that they had, the Sadducees were totally against this. So what's the next move? Let's throw them in prison. That's what they did. They imprisoned the apostles. They didn't tell us how many of them. And in the night, the angel said, what, what are these guys doing, man? He just opened up the doors and let them out. Now, these guys were fast asleep. Either he knocked them out in sleep, he put them out to sleep. I don't have a clue how that happened. But whatever he did caused them to not be able to know what was going on. Brought them out and he said, hey, by the way, guys, Go back into the same temple area tomorrow and preach the same message. Then they came together and had a great discussion with the people who were in the prison. How did this have happen? Well, we, we didn't even know. How did this happen? Can you imagine? God brought you out and they didn't have a clue what was going on. God protects his people. In chapter Um, 12. This one you are going to like. I'm going to give this to you for a little while. In chapter 12, from verse 3, there's another prison experience. These guys were thrown in prison so often, you see. None of us have ever been in prison because of Christ. 
In chapter 12, let me tell you the background to this. Um, the Herod has just killed John the Baptist. He had just beheaded him, chopped his head off because he confronted him with some issues. By killing John, Herod realized, hey, everybody loves me. So he wanted to get a little bit more brownie points. So the next person he set his mind on was Peter. He decided John the Baptist got killed. We got rid of John. Now we want Peter. No, not John the Baptist. One of the John disciples. Sorry, not John the Baptist. One of the John there, okay? Set aside Peter. So, chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Let me read verse 1. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John. Sorry, James, the brother of John. With the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Wow. And when he had apprehended him, we call it, when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarter, quarter known of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Then Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But what was made? Prayer was made without the ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now Herod decided, well, since he put this is going on there now, when Herod would have brought him forth, that means some period of time went by, the night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Look at it. Bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. When they talk about these four quadrants, let me call them the four quadrants, it means four by four. They work in shifts. Nobody was allowed to sleep. They would chain you to the guy, chain your feet, and you're chained to the soldiers. So if you make any movements, they'll wake them up. Nice, eh? You talk about secure prison? That's a secure prison. We talk about secure prison here? That's a secure prison. People have their own cells here. They're in a common area. We're going to chain them to the soldier because we don't trust what happened earlier before in Acts chapter 5. These guys get out and nobody knows that they, how they get out of there. This time, they're not getting out. We're going to kill this one. James got killed. We're happy. Praise God. Herod, we're going to kill another one. He's the leader. Kill the leader. And the sheep will scatter. That's the eye there. Well, listen to what happened. So these people were praying in the prayer meeting. And behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him. Verse 7. And shi light shined in the prison. Hmm. And smote Peter. That means he woke him up on the side. And raised him up. He said, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Go thyself and bind thy sandal. Put on your clothes and put on your shoes. And so he did it. And he said, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. In other words, pull your clothes together and walk close right behind me. And he went out and followed him. And knew not that it was true which was done. By the angel, but thought he was having a what? He thought he was dreaming. This is not for real. I'm not leaving prison. Am I, will somebody wake me up, please? So he's having a vision. When, he, when they were past the first and the second ward, they got to go through all of them, they came onto the iron gate that led into the city, which opened to them, wow, of his own accord. And they went out. Passed through one street and forth with the angel took off. Really? We all know what Peter did. He went to the house where they had the prayer meeting, knock on the door, and the little girl came and peeked on and said, Hey guys, it's Peter. Somebody said, No, 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 it's not Peter, it's a spirit. <laughs> now they're having a prayer meeting to bring him out. Peter showed up and he had to be his dead spirit. The brother must have died. This same thing, sister. Yes, he kept on knocking. It's, 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 it's me, it's me. What's the point I'm making here? Peter and, Peter and the others were arrested for the sake of the gospel. Heirs of salvation. Now, the things we do that are connected to God, God's angels will always work on our behalf. He wouldn't help you to go and rob a Brinks armored truck. 
I want you to get the point I'm making now. I'm making the distinction simply because some people get the conclusion that angels will help them do anything, include breaking the law. And by the way, I need about $100,000. Angel, would you guard me as I go into this bank with this note today? No, 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 no. Don't have those kind of ideas. The angels will never move on you and lead you to do that which is against the law that is established that, that will mess up the whole program. Brought them out. Can you imagine when those soldiers got up the next morning? Chains gone. Gate open and closed. Where is he? How could he have left? Get the point I'm making? The angels are here to protect us and deliver us. Every day I thank God for the angels that are ministering spirits. Every day I do this. I thank them every day. I say, God, I thank you for the angels who are ministering spirits. When I go to sleep and I say, I thank you that they're going to watch over me, watch over whatever, whatever. I tell them about all that. I believe that in all my heart. I believe that every child of God, conscious of the movements of God, conscious of the activities of the Spirit of God and also of the angels are always our protective program. We are protected divinely by God. So angels are on your case every day. You know they listen to when you talk to? Yeah, they have these conversations. They say, no, what is the matter with you? I'm standing right here. You start panicking. I'm here to knock this person out. Give me a chance. Are you so afraid of them? Do not be afraid. Angels said that to them many times in the Bible. Jesus said it. Jesus said many times, do not be afraid. Angels, the angels do not like and they, 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 they can't operate effectively with us with fear. Fear cripples the movements of faith. So if you find yourself in a situation, get rid of fear. It will motivate the confidence inside of you and the angels will work on your behalf. So do not be afraid if the water is troubled, I will get you over the other side if that's where you need to go. That's all they're saying. Do not be afraid for the interview. They're just humans sitting on the other side of the desk. <laughs> this one fellow told me a funny joke. He told a group of people. He said, you know what I did when I was a young person growing up? And I go for an interview. I go to the interview and in my mind I envisioned the person naked, he said. Yeah, that was his strategy. Seriously. He said, I envisioned a person naked. He said, and all came to my mind and just smiled. He said, it woke an automatic smile for me all the time. I said, hi, ah, how are you doing? It's nice to see you. In his mind, he wasn't afraid because he envisioned the person being naked. I said, that could lead to some lustful experience too. He said, yes, that one, I didn't want to handle it that way either because it would create a problem for me. What is my point? Some people do all kinds of things to get over fear. But God has given me, I have not given to you the spirit of fear. I've given you a spirit of love, power, and a song mind. Last point I'm going to give to you. The angel in the book of Revelation. It's the last one. It's the last one for you. If you want to find out how supernatural he is, first thing he did in Matthew chapter 28, remember the angel that rolled the stone away? Remember him, Matthew 28 and 2? It was the angels that rolled the stone away. They're powerful, man. You don't need help when you have the angels around. You can't call in... Batman and Robin and the Iron Man and all the other people that they advertise these days and all these superstars. Revelation chapter 20. I want to give this to you. I want to show you how wonderful and powerful the angels are. This is now coming to the millennium now. God is going to reign on the earth. And I saw an angel, verse 1, come down from heaven. An angel? Uh-huh. Having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. You put all the names together here now. And bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. That he should destroy the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. I'm going to close now. A great, an angel came down from heaven. The millennium is about to start. Christ has already come back. 
He's about to establish his reign. But Satan has to be moved out of play. He has to. It's going to be a period of peace. 1,000 years of peace, of reigning and ruling. During that time, all of Israel will function with sacrifice and systems too. In fact, during the tri tribulation, there's going to be a bit of that going on again. In fact, lots of it. They're rearing the heifers now. They're training priests now. They're doing all that thing for later on, for the activity, the continuation of that. The tribulation is God, listen to this, the tribulation is God's dealing with the people of Israel for seven years. The first, he had prophesied 77. 70 years will be accomplished. 69 is already fulfilled. There's one more year, one week to be fulfilled. One year, seven years to be fulfilled. It's considered a week in the Bible. During that tribulation period, all kinds of things can happen. Sacrificing system. But in the 1,000 years, Christ is going to reign and rule on the earth. We will be with him from Jerusalem. But it's going to be a period of peace. A child will die at 100 years old. So if you die then, if you die, 100 years old, you consider the child. So Methuselah, 969 years old, you can live longer than that. You can live that year during the millennium. Wow, you mean to tell me on this earth people are going to live like Methuselah? Uh -huh. It could be a period of peace. We are going to live forever. I'm not worried about 969. <laughs> I'm, I'm in this thing forever. I think I'm going to have a, a wonderful body and healthy body looking a certain way, but we recognize one another. I'll know you, you'll know me. We'll chat about old times. This will be such fellowship time. We'll be able to move all the place. Let me run. Let me not carry it away here now. I can easily, that can easily happen. When I think of Revelation, I think carried away. But here's the point. An angel come down. That old dragon Satan that messed up Adam and Eve in the garden, that created all this mess in this earth. One angel would take care of him. He grab a chain, figuratively speaking, binds him, say, I've got a place for you. Come, let's go. I am taking you to your place for 1,000 years. You're going to be locked up so secure, you can't come out until we let you out. I can see him talking that. I can see me talking that. He said, you are bad, 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 bad news for everybody. You mess up everybody, you know. So today, we're going to mess you up. We're going to chuck you away. Tuck him away for 1,000 years. At the end of it, he'll be released again on the earth for a period of time. A period of time. Why? Simply because there are people who are going to be born during the tribulation, millennium period. During the tribulation too. Millennium period. Who have never been exposed to being tempted. Hey, those people who? Those people. Would never be, no, let's reason with God now. Would it be fair for all those people during the millennium age to be born on this earth just like we were and never be tempted by a devil? Adam, the first man, was. Nobody's going to be exempt from it. So they have to be tempted. He has to bring about his slow business. But here's the thing he's gonna, God's going to give them a choice. Who am I bringing into the eternal state? And they're going to be born of sinful parents. For all have and come short of the... It doesn't mean because you're born in the millennium time that you're not sinful. So should they not be? He was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. The point he's making here, he's going to be released then to be tempted. But after that, he's going to be cast into the lake of fire where he's going to live for all of eternity. Satan, your time's up. God's good. Who, was, who got the job to tie him up? An angel. They're powerful. Powerful. This one can handle Satan all by himself. God doesn't want you to try and handle Satan by yourself. He kick you like a ball all over the world. For greater is he that is in you, he that is in the world. Just understand who you are in Christ. Christ will stand up for us at all times. And he will release angels to minister to all of us. Father, bow. Father, thank you for this time that we just had together on your word. It feels so refreshing.
It's quite encouraging to know that we've got such a package deal. We want everybody in this world to get a share of what we have. So help us to have a desire to invite and talk to other people so that they can be part of that which we are experiencing in your son Jesus. Father, we submit ourselves to you right now. We commit ourselves afresh to you. We ask that you cause your presence to be so real within us that every single aspect of our lives will be measured by the power of the Spirit of God who lives within us. Thank you for the angels that are consistently working on our behalf. We appreciate them. And sometimes I talk to them anyway. I pray that we'll all learn to talk to them. Hey, I know you're hanging out with me today. I need your help today. This is very hard. I know you're here to serve me. I'm not going to command you to do anything foolish. Not that I'm going to command you to do anything wrong. But I'm glad that you're with me today. Help us to be conscious of his pres their presence. Just like we're conscious of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're conscious of the presence of God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. And we live and walk in confidence as of this day. Knowing that we are secure in Christ. We give you praise and thanks. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our message presentation by Pastor Raymond Burnett. If what you have heard has been helpful to you, please tune in again or write us and let us know how this message has ministered to you. Our email address is pastor at mwctoronto.org or call us at 647-340-9252. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to support this teaching ministry, you can send a donation to our mailing address, 170 Oakwood Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M6E-2T9. If you are in Toronto or surrounding area, our meeting place is at St. Charles Catholic School. Address is 50 Claver Avenue, Toronto. Thank you for listening.